Good evening, everybody. We are all right. Mm -hmm. Getting started here. I'm doing what we have to do. Getting started here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, good people. We say welcome to you all to New Calvary Baptist Church's um uh, bible study as we continue this bible study series working with each other um we hope and pray that god is continuing to bless you uh, and speak to you in special and unique ways hope you had a wonderful day hope that god has continued to bless you and god is continuing to pour out into you uh, as you share in this particular moment um we look forward uh, to what we believe is going to be a rich dialogue, rich Bible study, uh, empowering uh, and transformative in this moment. And so uh, we are going to get engaged with this living with the limp of insecurity uh, as we talk about how God operates in this place of insecurity uh, and how we might better uh, meet uh, our obligations all right, as people of faith. Okay. Um, uh, so let us have a word of prayer and we will begin. God, we love you. We're grateful. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for blessing us and watching over us in this season. We ask that God that you would just pour into us that you would feed us and encourage us, God, as only you can. Lead us and direct us in this moment. And in all things, we give you praise. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So listen, uh, talking about living with the limp of insecurity. All right. So so um how many of you uh out there both and facebook live and who are chilling with us on zoom how many of you all are familiar with the show insecure you're familiar with the show insecure it's on hbo some of you might even check it some of you might even you know watch it occasionally get caught up get hung up in insecure insecure those of you who don't know is an hbo show by Issa ray uh, who talks about the journey in life of two african-american women uh, who are just trying to figure things out um it's a sitcom Issa and Molly are the two young ladies who are just for all intents and purposes trying to work through the challenges of their late 20s. Uh, Issa deals with situations that cause her to feel awkward. They cause her to feel unusual. And she's often finds herself in the show. She finds herself in the mirror talking to herself and dealing with certain issues uh, and she's either trying to outthink or determine what the results are going to be the character is dealing with feelings overall of how she enters into situations she's wondering if she's going to be liked she's wondering what the best way to handle things are she's wondering what the best way to to do this or to do that how should she approach this how should she not what will people say uh and what drives her decisions to the most uh, of, of the time is what people think uh, about what she says or what she does the show deals with a young woman trying to navigate, essentially, her insecurities. Insecurity is a tendency um, that we have to lack confidence of certainty of ourselves for whatever reason. 
Insecurity is about dealing with those places when we are filled with self-doubt. What do we do when we are filled with places where we may doubt ourselves? Uh, that there are many different forms, many different ways that insecurity shows up. And it can show up even in the people who appear to be the most confident. It can appear to, for those who even have the most confidence or who could be the most assured that insecurity rests and relies in them as well. Many times it's not even about the things we accomplish or the sense of how we are liked, uh, but we are, but, but we're influenced by the people around us and what other folk might say or may think about us. Insecurity is an internal feeling that is ultimately rooted in fear. Um, many times we can feel like we are not as talented, not as charming, not as gifted, not as accomplished, not as confident as we portray ourselves. And we are afraid that we will be exposed as a fraud and be exposed that people will know the real us, that we're really afraid at any given moment. See, many people can manage their insecurity and, and it does not have a lasting effect. Some people can just work through their insecurities. They can work through them. But if some people have feelings of insecurity for too long, for a longer period of time, the doubt and negative feelings that they experience can have a significant effect. It can have a long lasting effect on how they interpret everything. A person with high levels of insecurity may often experience a lack of confidence. Uh, regarding many aspects and many different periods in their life. It may become difficult for people to form lasting relationships uh, or keep daily tasks going uh, due to a, per, a, a perception of how people feel or, a, or an understanding of how they believe people feel and say they can get to a place where they can feel helpless, they can feel inadequate, uh, and they feel like they can't accomplish things. So if we're not careful, the feeling of insecurity can overwhelm us in places to where we are actually frozen to do anything or to move forward. Then needless to say, to live in this perpetual state, if we were to live like that constantly, to live like in that level of security, we would be living with a significant limp. That's the truth. If, if, if we lived like that, it would be what we would understand as a limp, that to operate in such a place of profound insecurity would affect everything that a person would do. It would affect everything that goes on in a person's life. The view and the lens in which the person would not just see themselves, but see themselves in every situation that they uh, were in and would alter their movement. It would alter their adjustment. It would alter their thinking and how they handled everything. We live in the situation first by understanding its perception. I need to say that again. We live in our situations first. The first thing we do in our situations is we understand the idea of perception. What will it look like? What would it appear like? What would it seem like? Right? That's the first place we go. Dr. Joy DeGruri, some people have heard me say this before. Dr. Joy DeGruri, who wrote this awesome book, Post Traumatic Slave Disorder, she wrote something that's very, very significant. She said, We are not who we think we are. We are not who people think we are. We are who we think people think we are. I'm going to let y'all sit on that for a second. We are not who we think we are. And we are not who people think we are. We operate and act like people th think who we think we are, right? That's a whole different level. So it's all about perception. It's not, it's not whether it's accurate or not. It's what we think people are thinking about us. And that's how we react and how we interact with folks. Right. Like, like how many times did you get caught out there uh, when you said something to somebody and somebody says, oh, OK, I got you. And you say, what you mean by that? You trying to be funny or what you trying to say? And they're like, nah, I hear what you're saying. That's all I'm saying. They're like, nah, what you really mean behind that? Right. Because it's all about what you think they are thinking, not what's actually happening, but not what the actual interaction is. And we often operate based on perception. And not those places of what actually is taking place or what is or, or what is reality. Okay. So um, so just real quick, there's no one cause, there's no one cause of insecurity. 
all right not one just this it could be several different factors that lead to the condition and uh, insecurity may stem from a traumatic event something can happen traumatic in our lives a crisis like divorce or bankruptcy uh, or a loss it can also result from one's environment right as unpredictably as unpredictability uh, or something that's upset in our daily routines can cause anxiety, can cause insecurity uh, in our ordinary routines and our ordinary events. People who have recurring insecurity, people who have a perpetual sense of insecurity may also have low self-esteem. Uh, they experience many kind of sometimes it's body issues, body image, you know, what they look like, you know, what they, uh, how they appear, lack direction in life. They can feel overlooked by others. They can feel like, um, they can feel like they're always the one, the last person picked for the baseball team or the kickball team in school. They can always feel like that. Uh, insecurity tends to surface in adults whose parents push them excessively in childhood. You know, parents who push their kids can, and insecurity can develop from that, often due to their parents' desire to succeed rather than their own desire to succeed. And then the adults who their significant others drive them to excel, right? Uh, often that drive to excel is an unrealistic place. It comes from an unrealistic place. Um, and so we need to make sure that we understand and we are clear about our own desires and our own goals, okay? So insecure individuals, in addition to struggling with the formation of healthy relationship, may also find themselves difficult to share emotion. Uh, or to be forthright about important aspects of daily life, such as those pertaining to work or school, right? They can be difficult to stay in. An individual who is too anxious or insecure may speak up about their abilities or their accomplishments a lot, right? Sometimes the person who's the most insecure is the most braggadocious, right? You know, well, look at me, look what I have, look what I'm driving, look where I am, look what I'm doing, right? They'll tell you how much everything costs. Oh yeah, look at that, it costs this much, it costs me, right? Because why? They want you to know or believe that they are good enough. They want you to believe that they have worth, that they're worthy. And so oftentimes they put their worth in material things. They put their worth in things of the material nature. Right. Insecurity about the economy or stability of somebody's job can take a toll on people. It can wear people out. It can get to a place where it can mess with them. Right. That mental health is connected to all of this. Our mental health is connected to a negative mood. It's connected to hypertension. It's connected to other kind of somatic symptoms um, that affect our bodies. Right. Insecurity is evident in a lot of mental health conditions. Right. Insecurity is in narcissism. Narcissism means, you know, when you think everything is just about you. Right. Insecurity can fuel narcissism. It can fuel schizophrenia. You know, we have different voices, different perceptions, borderline personality where, you know, folks simply nothing is right. Nothing ever goes right. Nothing ever works right. Paranoid personalities, dependent personalities where folks are needy and constantly needy. That insecurity that drives them in that way. Depression uh, for insecurity. Security, you know, because I, I, I don't feel safe, I don't feel secure, I'm constantly depressed, anxiety, what are people trying to do to me, what, you know, my insecurity, what are you trying to take from me, what are you trying to do to me, it can heighten my anxiety, eating disorders, body image issues, all of those things, uh, personality disorders and mental health orders can affect, can be affected and be driven by uh, a sense of insecurity and insecurity can be seen in regards to that, all right, so that's just a quick overview, and I wanted to, to hit us with that of ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about insecurity, because all of us experience it in some way, shape, or form, whether we experience it in a grand sense or whether we experience it in just spurts. All of us experience it in some way, shape, or form, right? But I think tonight we got a great example uh, from the text. We got a great example of some really good illustration in regards to insecurity. Uh, so listen, write down, jot down Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I think this is going to be a blessing to you. I think this is going to be really powerful. Um, so we're, we're looking at it from the New International Version, and then we're going to kind of break this thing down to see where Moses was in this moment. Now, in Mo's defense, that's my boy, I call him Mo. In Mo's defense, if I understand it's a major task, but we're going to use Moses's response to understand what it is to wrestle with insecurity. 
Okay, so Exodus chapter three, verses one through 11 says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. He said, um, Moses saw that through the book, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see the strange sight while the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. He said, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hevitites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites out of Egypt. Verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses is a fugitive. He's a fugitive shepherd taking care of his father-in-law's herds. And when he hears of God telling him that his next assignment is to tell Pharaoh to let his people of Israel go free, Moses goes through the preliminaries in understanding the reverence of the moment. He, he remove your sandals. This is holy ground. This is the presence of God. He gets all of that. So he acknowledges the power. He acknowledges the presence that he's working with, right? So Moses says, I, but Moses says, like the kids say nowadays, I got questions. <laughs> he said, I got questions, right? He says, the issue with being in this position, because there was so much going on with Moses at the time, he cannot believe that God is using him for this time, right? Look what he says in verse 11, but who am I that I should go to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Brothers and sisters, that's insecurity. What you mean? Me? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Who, who, who are you talking about? Me? right? Moses is insecure. Now, there are some roots of insecurity that I want us to examine in this lesson, okay? And there are different kinds of insecurity, and Moses helps us in this text see them all. He displays a lot of them for us tonight, so we can thank Moses for what takes place. Moses in this scripture does a good job in showing us what this insecurity thing looks like. Moses says, who am I? This indicates that Moses doesn't feel qualified to take on the task. One of the reasons that people are insecure, one of the places we struggle with insecurity is being insecure because of recent failure or rejection. Sometimes the reason we feel insecure is because of a recent failure or a recent rejection. Events in our lives can have a lasting effect on how we see ourselves and our abilities. Moses didn't just take care of Jethro's flocks. He's married to Jethro's daughter, right? And he has children with her. But he's lived there for a while. He had to have lived there for a while if he has kids, right? So this didn't just happen. Moses is on the run for a specific reason right? Y'all don't understand. Y'all forgot all about it. Look at Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 15. It says, one day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them in their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. 
the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you fighting, hitting in your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you the ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me like you killed the Egyptian? <gasps> Uh-oh. Then Moses was afraid and thought what I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat by a well. Moses is a fugitive, right? Moses is on the run. Moses is on the run from a murder that he committed in Egypt, and now he's hiding out in Midian. Moses leaves it, uh, Egypt because of the infraction, and time has passed, but what he's done still lives with him. Even though the time has passed, he still sees himself through the lens of the failure and the inf infraction. Much of Moses' hesitation comes from the place of knowing that there are some things that have happened in the past that form how he thinks about what's possible and what has potential for the future. And a lot of times what happens to us is the reason we are insecure is based upon what has happened to us. And then we bring that to the forefront and convince ourselves, well, it can't happen because of this. It can't happen because I used to do that. It can't happen because this happened to me before. It won't be successful because it wasn't successful before. What a lot of times our past rejections bring forth some of the insecurity we live with because of what has taken place before and they shape how we think right now. We, we, when we are rejected, when we're younger, when we're rejected in certain important places in our lives, and we don't want to be rejected now, we are made to feel inadequate because some time ago we felt inadequate before. James chapter 3 verse 10 says, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. That out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. And this ain't just talking about language. This ain't just about vulgarity, right? James is talking about what we speak into people, what is spoken into people. Out of the same mouth, praise can come into people, and out of the same mouth, cursing can come into people. Out of the same mouth, you can encourage somebody, and out of the same mouth, you can degrade somebody to the point that they never want to try again, particularly if we're talking about young people. So we have to understand that we've had experiences that shape what we think is possible, right? People, what people say can have a lasting effect on them. And we need to consider what kind of ideas we leave in people's mind, especially children, because we can shape their confidence. We can shape what they believe about themselves. So some things you can do to overcome your insecurity about failure or rejection. You can give yourself time to heal and adapt to a new normal. Give yourself time to heal and adapt to a new normal. Get out and engage in life, number two. Get out and engage in life. Follow your interest and your curiosity. Follow the things that interest you. Follow the things that spark your curiosity. You know what? I always wanted to learn about the monarch butterfly. Always wanted to learn about the monarch butterfly, right? Go learn about the monarch butterfly. Don't limit yourself because when you begin to shape yourself through limits, you won't explore. You won't try certain things. You won't see certain things. I had my friends in college. My friends in college used to joke me. They used to say, Marcus, you are the king of useless information. <laughs> They used to say, you are the king of useless information, right? But the reality was things always interested me and I would just research them, right? And now that we got like Google, my, I drive my wife crazy because I sit in front of the TV with an iPad, right? And then, you know, Idris Elba will come on the screen, right? And I'll be like, what part of London is Idris Elba from? I'll Google it. Right. And it'll pop up. Right. And then we'll be in conversation. I'll be like, well, you know, he's from, you know, the Brockshire place part of London. And somebody's like, who knows that? But because it's, it's this stuff I'm interested in. Right. So don't limit what, what you're interested in. Just find, you know, do research, do step out of your boxes to do things differently. Right. Um, because not only does it make you a different conversationalist, but, you know, it kind of, you know, 
broadens your sense of knowledge. So if there's ever a game show of truly useless information, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be okay. Right? So, so that's two. Get out and engage. Follow your interest and your curiosity. Three, reach out to friends and family. Uh, for distraction and comfort. So when you're feeling those places of insecurity based upon rejection, reach out to family and just let them feed your soul. Reach out to people who encourage you. Reach out to your friends and let them just, you know, spend time with you and remind you, take your mind off of that. Distract yourself from, from those kinds of feelings. Get feedback from people you trust. Is it really this bad? It, am I seeing this right? Am I getting this the right way? Am I understanding this the right way? Or am I seeing this wrong? From people you trust, because people you trust would be like, you know what, you're overdoing it. You're doing too much. <laughs> you're making too much. You're making an ant out of a, a mountain out of a molehill. You're doing too much, right? Or maybe there's something you, you need to look at, or maybe there's a concern. Maybe you need to work through it, right? Perse persevere and keep moving towards your goals, right? Keep pushing, even if it's scary, even if you're not sure, even if you're unaware, even if it gives you the creeps, even if it makes you feel like um, you're going to fail, even if it makes you feel like those voices starting to tell you, well, it's not really going to work. It's not really going to happen. Trust yourself and continue to push forward. And number six, be willing to try a different strategy if necessary. Don't keep running your head up against the wall saying this ain't working, this ain't working, this ain't working. Maybe you need to do something different. Maybe you need to go a different way. Maybe you need to ask God and stay in prayer to ask God to show you something different, right? Romans chapter 12, verse two says, do not conform to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, right? So that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Sometimes it is about the renewal of our minds. Sometimes we got to adjust our minds. We got to change our minds. We got to look at things differently. We got to analyze things differently so that we can approach it differently so that we can go different places. Moses, although talking to God, is still insecure. <laughs> and that's not new. Uh, every one of us who has heard from God that said, God said, hey, look, take this, go there, do this, take this leap, go back to school, reframe this, you know, go make that apology, go fix that relationship. All of us, even though we heard from God, all of us at one point or another said, hold up, <laughs> right? We let the insecurity, we let the pressure, we let our mind, we let ourselves out talking. And Moses is no different. As great as a leader and as great as a person of faith Moses is, Moses is not convinced that he's the right person for what God wants to do. It's not that God can't do what needs to be done. Moses isn't convinced he's the right person. And so as the conversation unfolds, we discover another issue that Moses struggles with. Okay, so look at that. Go to the next chapter. We read Exodus 3. Go to Exodus 4, right? Go to Exodus 4 verses 1 through 7. Moses says, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And so Moses reached out and took the held of the snake and turned it back into a staff in his hand. This said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand in, into his cloak and he took it out and the skin was leprous. It had become white as snow. Now put it back in your cloak, he said. And so Moses put his hand back in his cloak and he took it out and it was restored like the rest of his flesh. My Bible study people know how I take it there with that one. You know, that y'all know how I do that. If he put his hand in his cloak and he pulls it out and it's white as snow, what was it before he put it in there? I'm just saying. <laughs> it is what it is. Yo. I mean, it is what it is. And so when he put it back and took it out, it was restored back to the rest of his flesh. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just leaving that for y'all to think about. Um, that's another Bible study. We'll do it another time. So, so here it is. Moses says in the first verse of the next part of the conversation, what if they don't believe me or what if they don't listen to me? Moses is fearful of his interaction with individuals. He's afraid of rejection. 
What if they don't believe me? I can say this, but what if they don't believe me? He's afraid of rejection. Moses is not sure that he can sell what God wants him to do because he does not feel like he's believable. Moses in this context feels socially awkward. Another root of insecurity is a lack of confidence because of social anxiety. Another reason we're insecure is because of our social anxieties. Moses is dealing with the social anxiety. He's saying, what if I go to these people and they don't believe me? What if they say, man, you, you know, whatever. He's afraid to interact because he's afraid of the rejection. The fear of being evaluated. Here's the second, here's the second one, the lack of confidence because of social anxiety. The fear of being evaluated by other people can give a lot of us a, a whole lot of anxiety. Especially if we have been found deficient or we believe that we are deficient in some way. When we feel like we're being examined and evaluated, we feel self-conscious and anxious. If we feel people are looking at us, if we feel people are talking about us, if we feel and we get judged or evaluated on some level, we can become insecure and anxious almost immediately. Side note, this is why the social media scene is so popular and so dangerous at the same time. It's popular because you can say whatever you feel like saying. And feel strong when you say it, right? I mean, who are, who else in the room with you when you talk is junk, right? When you're making your statement, who else in the room with you? So you can say a whole bunch of strong statements. You can say a whole bunch of stuff. You can say a whole bunch of stuff that, that makes you feel strong and powerful. But what the other side of that is, can you handle it when people respond? Because when people respond, it attacks something inside of you internally. Right. It messes with you. It messes with with you. And when you make those declarations and interactions, it makes it less. And here's the other thing. What it does for us is it makes it less and less feasible for us to actually have human interaction. Right. So I can say everything I need to say. I can interact. I can call for my food. I can watch church on social media. I can even work from home now. I can do everything, but it reduces our human interaction, which is much more authentic, right? It causes us to be much more authentic. It causes something different. And so what we do if we spend too much time on social media is we spend our time being anxious around real people. Right? Because we don't know how to interact. We don't know how to socialize. We don't know how to engage. So what can happen with social insecurity is that we get to a place where we avoid interaction. We avoid social situations. We experience anxiety when we're in public spaces. We get to the place where we feel everybody is looking at us. Everybody's talking about us. Everybody got something to say. Past experiences feed our sense of not belonging. High school trauma, Man, getting teased in high school, oh my God, getting teased in high school, high school trauma, um, how you were treated, bullying, all of that stuff creates a great sense of distrust for social interaction, right? Uh, we become more concerned with how we are coming across to others than what they think about how we fit in to the scheme of things, right? The Hebrew tells, the, the Hebrew tells Moses, you're going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? That's, that's social interaction. Yo, the word is out about me. You gonna kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Oh, <laughs> what you heard, right? <laughs> you know what oh, wait a minute. What you hear about me? You know what I'm saying? Moses is wondering what people think about him, right? He says, listen, I'm gonna go back to Egypt talking about this is what God said. What are people gonna say? I don't even need no sound. Y'all know what they're going to say. What are they going to say? Moses comes back, a preacher, a voice for God. What are the people in Egypt going to say? What are the Hebrews going to say? Oh, here come this murderer. This, mur this murderer going to tell us what God said, right? They he the one, hey, look, they're going to pull up the path. They he the one that killed that Egyptian. How you get away from that, right? So there's a whole bunch of things that go on that can stir up our level of insecurity and our confidence when we engage in certain things, right? So here it is. Extremely insecure people focus on the superficial aspects of a person and not the character or the integrity of a person, right? So what they look like, 
what they dress like, how they present themselves, what the situation looks like is far more important than who a person really is on the inside and how they carry themselves. It's all about what it looks like on the outside and what it presents. So, which is often why the judgment of people is not worth getting worked up over. So that's why when people start to judge you, it really ain't getting work, worked up over because all they're paying attention to is the outside. They're paying attention to the event. People are often covering up their own securities when they're judging other people. They're covering up their own stuff when they're judging other people because if I keep if I keep this pointed at you, then nobody's paying attention to my own stuff, right? So so not only can they operate in places of flash and grandiose and be bombastic and tell you how much it costs or where they've been or what they've seen or how they've been or they know it all, you know them know it alls, you know anybody know a know it all? Yeah, y'all know a know it all. Like, like you talk about like women's shoes. He like, yeah, and, and even a dude, like, yeah, you know, I know about the, the good Louboutin, I know about the Vera Wang. It's like, dude, everything, you know something about everything. You know what I'm saying? Those know-it-alls, right? They always want you to, they got this sense of, I want you to know I got everything covered. I'm I'm social. I'm 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 engaged in it all. I got my finger on everything, right? And the only one who could really do that is me because I Google everything. I'm just playing. <laughs> I just set y'all up. But <laughs> I just set y'all up. But but the the whole the whole idea is right that this level right of of overconfidence can push and move to places of judgment which can which can confuse people because they feel judged they feel looked at they you know they can feel bad about themselves but if we put it in perspective then we understand that the integrity of who I am the mistake that I made or the event that took place is not ultimately the integrity of who I am or even the integrity of what I can become right then we can see judgment a little bit different all right. Numbers chapter 13, verses 32 and 33, it says, and they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. They were giants. And all the people we saw in were Nephilim. They were descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim, and we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. They told a lie. They told a rumor to keep from moving forward, right? Mo uh, uh, Moses sends uh, the people out. He sends Joshua and a team out to go see what the promised land looks like, and they said, listen, there's great possibility there. But there are people who are afraid and said they're giants over there. They are giants. And we look like grasshoppers, right? That's fear. That's, that's insecurity, right? Because we do not feel that we are as strong as they are. Even with God behind us, we don't feel like we can accomplish. The Hebrews saw themselves as grasshoppers. They saw themselves as small and their insecurity did not let them believe that they could be victorious. In fact, they spread it. They, they didn't want to go and they felt so afraid and insecure about it. They spread insecurity. Think about that. They spread insecurity, right? So they, which means it was an idea that was not good. Insecurities can have us spread some bad ideas about ourselves and others. Think about that. Because they didn't want them to go that way, because they didn't want them to embrace a certain mindset, they spread, they said things that made the people insecure. We're going to build a wall because they're rapists and murderers. They're coming uh, for the, 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 one of the greatest, the, one of the greatest rumors and in, in insecurities. They're killing and eating babies. Hillary Clinton and them are sacrificing kids and 800,000 kids are dying a year from, from the democratic machine, right? They, 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 they spread rumors about what's going to happen and what can happen, right? Because they want, they want you to be afraid of something. Right to the point where you don't you don't want to try it or even attempt to go forward. 
right? So if you are dealing with insecurity in regard to social situations, right? You're socially anxious, right? Interacting with people makes you socially anxious. Then there are a couple of things that you can do. Talk back to your inner critic. Talk back to your inner critic. That voice inside of you, talk back. Remind yourself that all the reasons you can be interesting and fun. Find out why you're a good friend, why you're a good partner, why you are a good person. Sometimes you have to go back to that, right? You feel, or you see a room full of people and you feel anxious. You say, you know what? I can hang. <laughs> you, you can hang. You, you, can, you can be funny. You can be witty. You can be conversationalist. You know, talk back to your inner critic. That, that when you have the urge to resist it, hype yourself up to, to, to let you know that you can handle it. Number two, prepare in advance. Think of some things you can talk about, right? Do what I do. Google it, <laughs> right? Make yourself interesting. Make yourself a conversationalist, right? Current events, movies you've seen, hobbies, your job, your family, other stuff, right? Don't make it all about you. Make it about other stuff, right? Interact with different things. Be able to be conversant about different things, right? That's the stuff that makes you interesting, right? Number three, avoid social situations that make things worse. So go to a party or on a date, even if you're nervous, right? Your anxiety should decrease once you get engaged more and more with others. If not the first time, then the second time, or third time, and once you get used to showing up, right? So basically just the, the routine of overcoming it. Number four, set yourself a limited realistic goal. You don't need 5,000 friends on Facebook in a week. <laughs> so this could be anything from just talking to two or three new people or finding more about a person's work and hobbies, right? Become more engaged, right? Number five, deliberately focus on others to combat intense self-focus. Think about other people. Think about what other people might be interested in. Put on your observer hat and notice what other people seem to be feeling or doing. Do you notice any similarities or skills? What do y'all have in common? What things can you talk about? What similarities do you have, right? Moses says, I am afraid about how I will be viewed. Moses is saying, people are gonna reject me because of how I'm viewed. I am concerned about how people will perceive me. And I'm not sure that I need to go ahead with this. God tells Moses that he is it under control. God tells Moses, I got it. Listen, trust me on this. There's a reason, there's a reason for all of this. But Moses gives one final Hail Mary. He finally gives one Hail Mary. If Moses was a card player, if he played spades or bid whist, he had the big joker last that he said, I'm sure this is going to make God say, okay, man, never mind. I'm going to let you off. Look at Exodus chapter four, verse 10. And this is a good one. Let's not play. This is a good one. Exodus chapter four, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in your past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Boom! You got to leave me alone. I got a stutter. I got a speech impediment. You got to leave me alone. I ain't smooth with the words, right? And Moses says, I got him. That's it. God going to leave me alone with this one right? Moses, being aware of his situation, doesn't want to mess up the assignment. Moses says, if you put me in this place, I, I, I get nervous in front of people. My hands sweat. I stutter when I'm in front of folk. I'm not a good public speaker. I, I'm not good at this, right? And I'm going to mess it up if you put me in front. If you do it, I'm going to mess it up. Third one, third and last one. Some of the insecurities we wrestle with are insecurities driven by perfectionism, a feeling of doing it perfect. Sometimes we're insecure because we're afraid we're going to mess it up. Sometimes we're insecure because we want it to be perfect. Some of us have very high standards in everything we do. Do you want the highest grade? You want the best job? You want to be in the perfect and best shape? Some of us want to have the finest and the best, right? But some things we can control, some things we can control. And then there are some things that are out of our control, some stuff we just can't control. Many times the need for perfectionism 
and to be perfect is a root from some things that have happened within our families. We had parents who pushed us too hard. Striving for perfection was the norm of the household, right? Some parents wanted to find a sense of accomplishment within themselves. And so they pushed you harder than they really needed to or should have, right? Family dynamics play a role in dealing with the idea that things can't be perfect, then we should not do them, right? You see it all the time in Little League and Pop Warner and young people's sports, right? The parents hollering and screaming and pushing their kids and pushing their kids and pushing their kids, and pushing, their kids and pushing their kids when it was them who didn't get picked for the football team when they were little, right? And so they pushing and they pushing and they talking about being the best. They talking about, you know, pushing themselves or whatever, whatever, whatever. And, you know, this level of perfectionism. And somebody, I was watching, I was watching something one time about a sports figure. I forgot who it was, but he was saying uh, his father, he got, he, he was, he was pushed so much. He got into alcoholism um, and became an alcoholic. And he was saying that his father pushed him, his father pushed him. And, and the reporter said, it's one of those practice makes perfect things. He was like, nah, he was like, my father, that's not my father saying practice didn't make perfect for my father. My father would say perfect practice makes perfect. Now, what kind of pressure is that? <laughs> right? I mean, you a teenager, you 12, 13 years old, and you can't even be bad at practice, right? You got to be perfect at practice, right? And don't get me started on Alan Iverson practice, practice. <laughs> we talk about practice, right? So the whole idea of, of how sometimes we're driven by senses of excellence, right? Now, understand there's nothing wrong with wanting to do your best, nothing wrong with wanting to be your best, nothing wrong with wanting hard work and giving your best effort, right? Because giving your best effort and working hard does put you in places where you can have an advantage. But other aspects of perfectionism can be unhealthy, Operating in other places of, of being perfect, right, can be unhealthy. Beating yourself up and constantly worrying about not being good enough can lead you to places of depression, can lead you to places of anxiety, can lead you to places of social disorder where you can actually start to do dysfunction to yourself, right? First Samuel chapter 18, verses 6 and 8. First Samuel 18, 6 and 8 says, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistines, the women came out from the town of Israel to meet uh, King Saul and the, with singing and dancing. With joyful song and timbrels and lyres, they danced and they sang. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Verse eight said, and Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And if that ain't insecurity, I don't know what is. Think about that. Saul is the king. The women singing and dancing came out to celebrate him. It's his parade. It's his kingdom. It's his nation. And because they're singing the song, and they're telling the truth, by the way. <laughs> you know, they're saying, well, the king slayed thousands. David, the general, slain tens of thousands. He says, what else can he get from me? If he can get, watch this, if he can get applause and accolades, what else can he get? Right? Saul is the king, but celebration of somebody else made him forget what he had and his own accomplishments. Saul has had to have it all in order to be okay. The only way Saul can be okay, if it's all about him, if he has it all. And that is the absolute impossible moment. That is impossible. It can never be all about you. It's impossible. Unless you are a malignant narcissist and try to make it all about you. But we already tried that with the last administration. We saw how that went, right? So don't miss what you've been blessed with because somebody else has been blessed. Don't miss what God has blessed you with and what God has given you just because somebody else is receiving and can acknowledge and has gift, talent, ability, or blessing. So there are ways to 
deal with the struggle of perfectionism. There are ways to deal with the struggle of perfectionism. Try to evaluate yourself based on how much effort you put in. What is controllable rather than the outcome, which is dependent on external factors. The outcome has got a lot of external factors. You concentrate on what you can do. What is it that I did that was right? What is it in terms of me giving my best? Number two, think about how much difference it would actually make if your work were 10% better. With the time and energy spent checking and rechecking or answering every email, answering every call, going extra mile, would it really be worth it? Because now there's something else we're learning, right? And, and we're learning it in a very big way when we go, where as we go back out, we see in restaurants all these help wanted signs and all these, you know, places that need help and even airlines now need people to work. What we are realizing now is something called self-care. Is that as hard as many people work, what people are discovering is, is I don't want to work my whole life away to the point where I don't experience anything for myself. And so self-care has become a primary thing. Self-care has become very, very important. So how 10% better, 20% better, does it make a difference? Or does it just bring you more frustration? Does it just bring you more anxiety? Does it just wear you out even more? Or watch this, does it make people just expect more of you? Because the more you do, the more they're going to expect. All right? So understand. Number three, perspect perfectionism is often based on an all or nothing thinking. We all kind of go all or nothing. So try to find the gray area, right? Is there a more compassionate way of understanding the view of the situation? How can I understand it differently? Are you talking about taking all circumstances into account when you evaluate yourself, right? Is there something you learned or achieved even if the end result wasn't perfect? What did I learn from it even if it didn't work out the way I wanted it to work out? Even if it didn't happen the way I wanted it to happen, what did I grow from it? What did I get from it? What did I understand from it? What did I come better? Number four, perfectionism often is conditional self-esteem, right? Perfectionists have a conditional self-esteem. So when things are going well, if things are on top, they're good. They like themselves when they're on top and they dislike themselves when things don't go their way. And the question is, can you learn to like yourself even when you're not doing well? Can you learn to like yourself even when you're not doing well? Focus on your inner qualities, like your character, like your sincerity. Do you have good values? Are you a good person? Do you treat people right? Rather just on what grade you got, <laughs> right? Or what or what was the end result? How much do you get paid? How much people like you? Those are the external things. But sometimes it's about the internal thing that is ultimately most significant. Philippians chapter four, and this is what I leave you with. Philippians chapter four, verses six through nine says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But the whole idea is that it's not about living a life of anxiety. Sure, there will be moments of anxiety. There will be moments when we are pushed to places of insecurity where we're not really sure, right? But courage is not the absence of fear. Renita Weems said this a long time ago, courage is not the absence of fear. We will all have moments of fear. It is a human emotion. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to persevere despite the fear we feel. Courage is the ability to push forward even though we're afraid. All right? I think one of the greatest examples of that is being able to um, talk to new people or greet new people, right? You might be anxious about it, but to be able to push through that and to do that, right? That's courage, right? I, you know, I, I much rather sit over here. I much rather do nothing, right? But courage says, I'm going to push through that. I'm going to persevere through that, right? And sometimes we're, sometimes we're courageous because we have to be, but sometimes we, we need to choose courage, we need to choose courage. Now, 
if if your anxiety and your insecurity it has moved you to a place of debilitating, then I would suggest that you speak to somebody, a therapist, a counselor, somebody to help you work through some patterns and some habits and some things you can do to kind of fight through your places of insecurity or anxiety. But it is doable. It is definitely doable. It is not impossible. And you need to kind of look at you know, ways in which you can do that. But the, but to live in a perpetual state of insecurity can only be debilitating for your progress and what God wants from you, right? Now, we know, we know the end of that story, right? Moses drops the trump card. He says, yo, I can't, I can't, I can't even speak. I can't even speak, right? What happens in that moment? God says, you know what? Your brother Aaron is coming to see you. Use him in that moment, right? That when the saints say the Lord will provide, that God will make a way, right? It is not about our limits. It is about God's possibilities. And part of our wrestling with our insecurity is that we get wrapped up in our limits and not God's possibilities. And so our, our assignment is how do we continue to trust and operate and move in the possibilities that God has for us, that we would step out of certain places. Um, and as we come, it, it's, not, it's not that time yet, we're in November, but as you are beginning 2022 and 2022 is coming and there's a lot that you got to think about. I mean, I don't care how old you are, what station of life you're in, where you're working, what you're doing, how many kids you got, where you live, whatever. There's a lot of conversation and a lot about the possibility of 2022. And so I want you to really think about a place that you can stretch yourself. Where can you step out in 2022? And where can you step out? This just ain't just for New Calvary people. This is for folks who will watch this later or people who, you know, are friends of New Calvary who are watching this. Where can you step out in the new year? Where can, where, what anxiety or nervousness or insecurity has you that you say, you know what, I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna step out on that and I'm gonna see what God has for that. Because if God can do it for Moses, even when you drop, even when you drop your best trump card, God says, but I still got it. I still got something to work out. I still got a way of working that out. God still has a way of working things out. So it's not about your anxiety. It's about trusting in the possibility of God. It's not about your insecurity. It's about trusting in what God can lay before you and what God can do. All right. So. Hope this was a blessing to you. Hope this helped out. Hope this was insightful in some way, shape, or form. Um, and we're going to continue to roll and do what it is we do. Next week, we're going to look at the limp of disappointment, how we can stay away from disappointment. We're going to look at the limp of disappointment um, and how we don't uh, perpetually live in disappointment. Um, so we are, I don't know, Minister Brownmore, I don't know. Which one are you talking about? I said so much stuff, I talk fast. I ain't talking fast, you're listening slow. That's what, that's what Lil Wayne says. I ain't talking fast, you're listening slow. <laughs> ain't that right, man? Um, so we hope this was uh, helpful to you guys and we look forward to continuing to share um, with you all. Please keep in mind, um, in the month of, oh yeah, Lump of Disappointment. Um, next week, we are going to look at disappointment and talk about how we manage our disappointment and how we live with our disappointment. Um, so um, please pray for Rosetta Cherry, uh, who lost her mother uh, this uh well, Pat, last week, um, the homegoing was today, and Reverend Mac preached that. And so we continue to pray for her and her family in this time. Uh, all others who are dealing in this place and all who are going through, um, we continue to pray for you all and lift their prayers 
that you want to lift up, you can please put those in the chat, drop those line, drop those in the line real quick, and we would be happy to just call those names for you. Um, but Sunday, we will be worshiping. This is men's month, so we want to make sure that you stay on top of that. Um, men have uh, some exciting stuff we'll be announcing. We'll also be talking about how we move forward uh, in the new year of 2022 very, very soon. Uh, as we talk about how we reorganize New Calvary Church, uh, how we step out. Uh, and some of y'all might be insecure or anxious, but we're going we gonna to try it. We're going to step out anyway, do what we have to do. So God bless you, all of those. Um, we spend, send a shout out to all of you on, on um, Facebook Live. Thank you all for tuning in and sharing with us uh, as we do this ministry. Uh, on Zoom and on Facebook, and we look forward to uh, sharing with you next week. So let us look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we depart in this moment. God, we love you so much, and we're grateful for this time together. We ask, God, that you would just continue to bless us and watch over us. Show us what we need to do. Show us how to trust you and give us the steps and the insight, God, to be faithful with you in all things. Thank you for those who have shared. Thank you for uh, the time to worship you. And we ask, God, that you would just continue to lift us up, direct us, keep us in all things. Until we fellowship with each other again, we want you to know, God, that you are worthy of it all and how grateful we are for who you are and what you do. And so keep us, God, in the wonderful and marvelous name of Jesus. We pray and we thank you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Represent. See y'all. All right. Y'all be good. Y'all behave yourself. <laughs> Take care of yourself and each other. All right, Big Mal. What's up? <laughs> Hello.